Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here today. I'm just going to give people a minute to start signing on, and then we will get started. For anyone who is joining now, I'm just giving people one more minute to sign on and then we will go ahead and get started. So you shouldn't worry if you hear silence for one more minute. Thank you so much. Okay, I will go ahead and get started. Um, I'm sure a few more people will keep signing on, but I don't want to hold any of you up. So thank you all so much for joining us for today's town hall. Just a little bit about who we are. We are the National Center on Family Support. And we're based out of Pittsburgh, funded by a grant from the Administration for Community Living and the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research. Our mission is to partner with government, academia, and the family caregiver community to transform research into services and programs. Our goal is to improve the care, health, and quality of life of people with disabilities and the families that support them. Today's town hall brings the other clinicians, healthcare administrators, and members of the disability and care event community to discuss the experiences of people with disabilities and caregivers within the healthcare system. Um, in terms of logistics, the webinar today will be recorded um, and will be emailed out to everyone who registered after um, we have finished processing it. For any questions that come up as our panelists are speaking, you can either put them in the chat 
with human A functions and someone um, will be monitoring those or you can use the raise hand function and someone will be able to unmute you so that you're able to speak. Now, I'm very excited to introduce you to each of our panelists today. Um, and before I introduce them, I should introduce myself. My name is Heather and I am the outreach coordinator here at the National Center on Family Support. I am a white woman with long brown hair. I'm wearing an orange short sleeve sweater. Um, I use a power wheelchair and I am in front of a window right now. Um, so we are joined by four amazing panelists here today. Um, I will tell you a little bit about each one of them and then turn it over to them to start talking. So uh, our first panelist is Christina Abernethy. She is a dedicated wife, mother of three, and passionate advocate for people impacted by disabilities. She is the founder of Love, Hope, and Autism, and is proud to be the coordinator for Changing Spaces Pennsylvania, a movement to build accessible restrooms with powered, height adjustable, adult sized changing tables across communities to promote inclusion. She also works as a family support and community engagement specialist at Achieving True Self, supporting families by hers. Um, she won the Achieva Award of Excellence for Family Support in 2018 and in 2019 was awarded a medal by the Autism Connection of Pennsylvania. She is a two-time best-selling co-author, most recently including You Are Not Alone, Stories, Resources, and Hope from Autism Moms, a book that is filled with inspiring stories, helpful resources, and hope for families to let them know that they are not alone in their journey. Thank you so much for joining us today, Christina. Um, up next is Dr. Josie Badger. She received her bachelor's degree from Geneva College in Disability Law and Advocacy, a master's from the University of Pittsburgh in Rehabilitation Counseling, and a doctorate from Duquesne University in Healthcare Ethics. She founded J. Badger Consulting Inc., where she provides youth development and disability consulting services for organizations on transition and leader development. She is the director of the National RSA Parent Training and Information Center Technical Assistance Center, um, the campaign manager for the United Way of Southwestern Pennsylvania's hashtag I Want to Work campaign, and is a field organizer for the Family Care Act that supports uh, paid family leave and the developer of TRAIL, a statewide advocacy and lobbying training program. Um, and in 2012, she was crowned Ms. Wheelchair America. So thank you so much for joining us here today, Josie. Our third panelist is Matthew Berwick, who currently serves as the program manager uh, for disability accommodation in clinical services for the UPMC Health System uh, Disability Resources Center, and he teaches part-time at the University of Pittsburgh. He has worked in the area of disability services for almost a decade, serving on local, state, and national boards for people with disabilities, and currently serves as the president of the United Spinal Association of Western Pennsylvania. Prior to joining UPMC, he worked in higher education and as a youth specialist 
focusing on youth transition services. He has a BA in elementary education, an MA in adult learning and training, and is currently enrolled here at the University of Pittsburgh, working towards his master's in health informatics. Um, he is also very active in Pittsburgh disability sports um, and advocating in many areas for people with disabilities. So thank you so much for being with us here today, Matthew. And our final panelist for today is uh, John Harris, who is an assistant professor in the Department of OBGYN at Pitt and a researcher at the McNee Women's Research Institute. He went to Williams College Medical School at the University of North Carolina, residency at the University of Kentucky, and um, has a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Health Services Research Fellowship at the University of Michigan. He has been here at the University of Pittsburgh since 2016, and his research focuses on health system issues related to obesity and the health system disparities. So thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, and with the intros out of the way, I am going to stop sharing my screen. No, sorry about that. There we are. And um, what I'm going to do first before we dive in any deeper uh, to the discussion is let everyone um, just say hello and briefly introduce themselves um, and talk a little bit about why they're here with us today. So let's start with you, Christina. Thanks, Heather. Hi, everybody. I am Christina Abernathy. And for a visual description, I am a white woman with long brown hair. I'm wearing a black shirt with a gray sweater. Um, and I'm sitting in my dining room with lots of school materials on the back end because we did 15 months of homeschooling during COVID. So that's me. Um, I am a family supporting community engagement specialist at Achieving True Self. We provide ABA therapy for children and adults up to the age of 21 with an autism diagnosis. Um, I'm also known as Love, Hope, and Autism across social media, where I share um, our journey, different resources for families, connecting with families. I love to write. It's therapeutic, but I just love reaching out to uh, other families and inspiring hope. Um, I'm also the Changing Spaces coordinator for uh, the Pennsylvania chapter. So Changing Spaces is a nationwide campaign where we advocate for adult-sized changing tables in family restrooms, specifically for individuals who cannot use the restroom independently. So this is something I'm extremely passionate about, not only for my son, but for all people who need a safe, dignified private area to use the restroom when they're out in public. Um, so we are working on a state level um, to get a bill passed here in Pennsylvania that would require places like hospitals, highway rest stops, zoos, museums, sports arenas, and things like that um, would be required to have these. And we're also working on a federal level to get the building codes changed for 2024 that would implement these in these larger areas as well. So that's a little bit about me. Thanks so much, Heather. Thank you so much, Christina. We're so excited to hear from your perspective. Um, Josie, let's have you our next, please. Great. Thank you so much for having me, Heather. I'm Dr. Josie Badger, but the doctor is silent. Um, and I come from north of Pittsburgh. Um, I am a white woman with medium brown, like shoulder length hair. I am sitting in front of a window as well. Um, and I am using a ventilator and sitting beside my power wheelchair. Um, as for a little bit about me that Heather didn't share, um, I'm the mother of three beautiful dog children. Um, and I uh, really have taken a passion interest in healthcare um, because of my disability. Uh, I have a very, very rare condition that I was not diagnosed till the age of 11, even though it's genetic, I was born with it. Um, and so I went through a lot of testing as a child. And um, so 
really developed a passion for our patients and individuals that have to interact um, with the healthcare system. And I have 24 hour in-home care. So it is a natural part of my life. So I'm excited to talk with y'all. Thank you, Josie. Um, I hope maybe none of your dog children will make an appearance before our Zoom ends today. Um, let's have Matthew go next, please. Hi, everybody. Um, as Heather said, my name is Matthew. Um, I am a, a white male with short brown hair, wearing a light purple shirt and a pink, blue, and orange bow tie. Um, I think the, the reason that I'm here today, for, first and foremost, is as an advocate for people with disabilities and a person with a disability. Um, I also serve in my spare time uh, at QPMC as the program manager for disability accommodations and clinical services. Um, so advocacy is uh, really first, first and foremost the, the most important thing that I do. Um, and then work full time at UPMC and teach part time at Pitt and serve on and local, state, and national boards for people with disabilities. But free time. We're, we're so excited to hear from you today uh, with your uh, many very relevant perspectives. And John, if you don't mind, please bring us uh, to our last intro. Thanks so much, Heather. My name is John Harris. And I'm the director of the Center for Women with Disabilities at UPMC McGee Women's Hospital in Pittsburgh. Um, and I provide general women's health care services for women with um, intellectual, physical, and sensory disabilities. I've been here for the past five years. Um, I have a, a research interest in how the healthcare system interacts with people with um, with physical and intellectual disabilities, people with severe obesity, as well as women um, trying to access reproductive services. And um, I am happy to be a part of this group. And I'm also excited that Nidler has recently funded the Center for Pregnancy and Disability Research, um, which McGee will be able to be a part of. So um, I have a lot of passion around providing care and um, excited about being here today. Oh, I, my name is, I'm, I'm a white male with short hair, it's always getting shorter or thinner at least. Um, I'm wearing a white shirt with a blue, red, and a yellow bow tie, and I'm in a somewhat under-designed um, office building, so sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I think this is the first Zoom I've been on with two panelists both wearing bow ties, so this is very exciting. Um, so to start out, with our discussion today, I'd like to start out kind of on the high level general overview. If each of you could just talk a little bit about your experiences navigating the healthcare system, whether it is as a disabled person, uh, whether it's as the caregiver of a child with a disability, or as a practitioner or an administrator, just to kind of talk a little bit about what your experiences have been like navigating the system. And I won't assign this to anyone, so if anyone is welcome to start talking. Thank you. Um, sure, I can start. Um, so healthcare, <sighs> for an average individual is tricky when you're transitioning from pediatrics to adult medicine. Um, and, you know, often I think a lot of people just go to mom and dad's doctor, or, you know, whoever their family practitioner is. But often for those of us with disabilities, that's not a good option. Um, and a lot of those family practitioners are not um, comfortable with taking on our level of care. And so often, I've found both through my work and people I work with in my own care that it takes the experience of other people with disabilities to help locate physicians who are able and willing to take on that care. Um, and sometimes those are not necessarily individuals that totally understand your disability, although that's ideal, sometimes it takes a person who's willing to learn and to grow with you um, and to listen to you. Because, you know, as a person with disabilities, we've been living with 
this condition, um, sometimes since birth, sometimes multiple years. And so it's important to find those doctors who are willing to communicate, work with others, play well with others, because that's not always a, a, a thing um, in the medical field, um, but somebody that keeps us as team members in our care provision. I think that's a really excellent point, Josie. Um, and when you, when you mention as team members, are you, do you generally rely on one provider or are you working within a, a network of um, providers and specialists? I am those multiple network people. Um, you know, Pittsburgh does it up with multiple networks. Um, and the ideal situation is you stick with a system that everyone talks to each other um, and everybody shares records. Um, but I think that that's, again, where this team player comes into factor, where if we're not in the same system, we're not using the same records or whatever, um, that that medical professional is willing to reach outside the network and share and talk um, to each other because it does take all the different moving parts to be able to live at home with a complex medical need, to be able to stay healthy. Um, often it's not the disability itself that's not being cared for, but it's the other elements of care, such as OBGYN, such as vision or dental. And so those are the areas that are often left out of the conversation. Thank you. I think that that communication is really very important. Um, Christina, I would love to hear a little bit from you as a caregiver of a child with a disability about what your experiences have been like navigating that system. Sure, and I want to apologize because I don't think I said that I am a wife and a mom of three. Um, and so honestly, the healthcare system, having three children, um, three very high need children, I might add, um, but our one son that is autistic um, and has some other medical health issues, there has just been, there's been very good experiences with the healthcare system and some that are not so good. And um, I just feel like we're constantly in this waiting game and this fighting for services and things like that. So that's a, a really big struggle as, as his mom and caregiver. Um, and our son is limited in his verbal speech um, and he does use a device to communicate. So sometimes that makes it difficult when we are at different um, doctor's visits or you know if he's an inpatient for any reason, which my goodness, I think everybody tries to not have that happen. But when that happens and if that happens, um, it can be it, it goes one way or the other. It's either a very good experience or it's a very bad experience. And I love what Josie said about people who were willing to listen and to learn and to grow with you because without that, um, if you have people that are not willing to learn this other way of communicating or to listen to him in his own way, um, it's very important to us as his parents as he gets older to start advocating for himself and we're trying to teach him how to do that and things like that. But for us, you know, as his parents and as his caregivers, it's it's important to us that we are also heard. Like we want his voice heard, but we also want them to know that he is our child and we know him best and the things that work for him that don't work for him um, and things like that. And sometimes I just think that as the parent, we get dismissed and, um, you know, feelings might not be validated or we might not be heard or things are misconstrued. So that's one of the biggest struggles for us is just finding people who will listen and learn, as Josie said, which I, you know, I, I um, appreciated her saying that so much because I, I feel like we are all in that same boat. Um, and so I, I hope as he gets older, you know, that we find more people who are willing to listen and learn. And especially um, being autistic, you know, they have that saying, you, we, you meet one individual with autism, you, you have met one individual with autism. And that is so true because they are all so different and unique and in their own way. And I just, I hope that people take the time to learn and educate themselves on that and about that. Um, so even though you had John yesterday that came in that's autistic, you know, Sally will be different. My son will be different. And I just hope that everybody, you know, learns and respects that. So um, thank you for, for asking me in my opinion, but um, I, I, I just appreciate everything Josie said to piggyback off of what she said. 
Thank you so much. And I will definitely be coming back to you a little bit later to talk um, a little more about being a family caregiver and how we can better incorporate them into our health care system. But I'm going to let everyone else uh, finish their thoughts before I dive in any deeper on that. Maybe, um, John, I know that Josie mentioned, you know, how uh, certain specialties like vision and dental are often not uh, thought about. And I think that reproductive services and gynecology can fall into that realm, especially for women, um, where women needing access to that kind of care is, as a disabled woman, is sometimes not considered a priority. So I'd love if you could share a little bit about your experiences at the, I think it's called the Center for Women with Disabilities. Do I have that right? Yes. Thank you so much. Um, you know, it, I, I only know um, a little bit of the stories of the, the patients that I see in my office, but I obviously, I do just have an amazing amount of, a, of at least appreciation from the outside about how challenging often every healthcare interaction is. Um, and, you know, understandably there are, for each individual, there are going to be some central services that are essentially, you know, mandatory, you know, whether that's a PMNR doctor or a urologist or a neurologist, or there's, you know, it's going to be different for everyone. Um, but there are the central services, but I, and I, and for most people, I, women's health doesn't fall into the central services. But we really aim to try to um, to help individuals, you know, access the full experiences of life, um, including talking about pregnancy and parenting, talking about interests in relationships, and making sure that quality of life is really good. So I think that's really important to um, to look at people's whole lives. Um, if you're a caregiver, if you're an individual with a uh, disability, just to know that. Um, there are parts of your life that may not be what you consider like mandatory things to take care of, but if um, that there are providers out there that you know deeply desire to improve quality of life, and you know, that also goes for caregivers. I you know frequently ask caregivers you know whether you know helping manage periods or manage uh, behaviors around periods or things like that, whether that would improve their quality of life as well, because. This is an important team that we want to make thrive and it's my honor to be able to care for patients for a few minutes every year uh, i really want to make that caregiving and person's life you know amazing all the time and if i can help a little bit so women's health care for obvious reasons maybe is one of the most challenging technically to receive um, for people with physical disabilities the, the, having to get undressed into a pelvic exam can be considered relatively demanding um, under the traditional rubric of how we do um, often do exams. And so having a specialized center that um, that really, I think, you know, thrives under those needs uh, is, is an honor to be a part of. And then for people with intellectual disabilities, it's obviously an exam that is hard to describe to people and can be, um, uh, you know, unsettling and concerning. And so having providers that are better comfortable with that um, interaction as well it's going to be really important, and I think that you really should uh, seek a provider that is that you think is going to do a really great job for you because these are long term relationships. And I think that if you're not happy with your uh, provider that it's really worth the trouble of going and finding another one rather than sticking with a so so relationship. Um, maybe that would be my only uh, you know, pointed you know, feedback there. Thank you so much. It sounds like there's a lot of consensus between panelists about taking that time to find the right provider who will really work with you being a really important part of the care process. Before we move on, Matthew, I'd love to hear a little bit about your experiences. Yeah, thanks, Heather. So um, I think it, it's a unique perspective that I get to live in. Uh, having a spinal cord injury and interacting as a patient um, and an end user of services, but also being able to see it on the back end. Um, I, I think one of the most exciting things that we've been doing at UPMC over the last three years is figuring out how to document disability in the electronic health record. 
um, from both the inpatient and outpatient side so that every time you come in, that's part of your electronic health record. And this is something that comes with um, race and gender and all of the other uh, special characteristics that that patient brings with you. Um, and one of the, the challenges that we faced specifically was that there's not a national standard for how this information is documented in the electronic health record. Um, and a lot of health systems don't document in the electronic health record. So, um, you know, that's the, the next step in advocacy is, you know, we've been able to figure it out from the UPMC perspective, but then sharing that information broadly with the Cerners and the Epic on how we've done it so that other health systems can adopt the, the standard that we've brought forward with how we document disability and electronic health records so that every provider and every person that is interacting with that patient with a disability sees that disability and those accommodations that that, pa that patient needs every time they come to the hospital or every time they come to an outpatient appointment. That's really great, thank you so much. Um, and that leads me very nicely into my next question, um, which is about uh, services and supports that exist or that you wish existed. So I think, you know, noting uh, disability in the health, in your health care record is a support that would be really beneficial to patients um, who don't have to then make sure that their accommodations are met before every single visit. So I'd love for any of you to talk a little bit about either supports that you have used that have helped to make um, your time in, uh, in the healthcare system a little bit easier or supports that you wish existed that would make the process simpler for you. Or um, in John, in your case, supports that you've used as a provider that have helped make it easier for your patients. Heather, I might jump in just for a moment. We do have a question that's sort of relevant to the previous uh, question. And um, so uh, Janet Shows had a question for Dr. Harris about whether there's a list of providers or some organization uh, that focuses on women and disabilities so that people could easily find someone like you. I'm not sure how easy it is to find a knowledgeable OBGYN. Unfortunately, we don't have a, um, a list. Uh, I hope that it's a lot larger than I know it to be. You know, there are centers in a lot of um, a lot of places, certainly academic centers do draw a little bit more. So there's one at Michigan, there's one in Boston. Um, we, we kind of consult with people all the time when they're trying to start these. There's going to be one in Northern Virginia, um, one in Baylor in Texas, but um, there's not enough of them. And it and I mean, another way of thinking about it is that a lot of these providers, I think there are passionate um, clinicians out there that would um, would love to take care of you or your loved one, but they may not have the term disability in their care. And that's where it may help to, um, you know, enter into a system and to ask, ask, you know, whatever the kind of the primary care person that might be knowledgeable about your disability, whether they have a, a women's health provider that they know of, or to go to a larger women's health system and to then start asking around who's the person that does it the most. That's certainly true, you know, with dental services that it's a, it, they're providers that really do love providing this care that are out there, but they may not always have titles that are easy to pick out. So I, I think access is so, so, but there are very few centers that are as specialized as um, what I'm familiar with in Pittsburgh. Thanks. I'm going to go ahead and wait for the end of your questions, yeah. Heather, to address uh, Michelle Cohen's question. We can put that as another question. Yeah. I was just going to say that. Yes, thank you. Yes, Michelle, we built it to yours um, at the end of our kind of panel discussion when we open it up for larger questions. So let's go back to talking about supports that you either uh, have used or that you wish that you could use to make your um, utilization of the healthcare system a little bit easier, whether it's um, 
digital, but Matthew mentioned with the electronic healthcare record or something more physical and tangible. Maybe John, you could get us started um, and talk a little bit about, um, I know you mentioned that the uh, sometimes traditional uh, climatological exams can be physically taxing for your patients. So are there any sort of um, adaptive equipment or anything like that that you use at the center to make it easier for your patients to access that care? Um, you know, we are um, you're blessed to be able to have a lot of different accessibility um, options for people. So, you know, the, the, the two like kind of classical situations is we may have someone that um, needs help with ambulation and may need assistance with being able to support their legs during a pelvic exam. And then we have patients that may not fully understand what a pelvic exam is, may have a lot of, you know, distrust of us of a unusual provider trying to do a, a very intimate exam and we need to um, to earn their trust and overcome uh, those challenges, ideally providing the care in an office setting rather than under anesthesia. So um, in both of those cases, you know, I, I rethink like kind of have the whole spectrum of options. So, you know, we know that it's important to have parking available for people, um, whether they're coming, you know, whether they're coming in a, an accessibility van or, or whatever else, we need to know that patients need to be able to find our office, which, you know, is in a, a large building. And so people, when they may um, see patients that are coming to see us, they help direct them that way. You need to have a front office that's accessible to people who use wheelchairs for mobility. You need to have a, I'm, I'm so honored that we have a, a waiting room that's large enough so that if people are coming in with loved ones that may be, you know, louder than, you know, other patients um, or, or whatever else that it's big enough that people can kind of go off in different areas and they don't need to feel uncomfortable waiting for us to see us. We like to have a, we have a scale that works for wheelchairs. We have a, a you know, footrests that work for people that, um, you know, cannot support their legs in that position that the gynecologic exam is normally in. We have extra staff, we have longer appointments. If, if I was to turn around and say, what would I recommend to someone who may not know what that's available is that um, I think you, you want to look for hopefully an ex someone that's willing to learn, and then you need to offer them a few things that you need help with during this visit. So say, I, I do not think, I don't know how to do the, the gynecologic exam, you know, the way that I have heard that it works. We're going to, you're going to need to help me with my legs because I can't support them. And I want to be able to give, you know, get weighed, or I want to be able to give a urine sample. And I'm worried that the bathroom will be too small because I've experienced that in the past. And I think that at least in terms of specialty care, that giving people, you know, a few targeted needs will, will help kind of key off your providers that they need to be prepared for those things, that they can come up with some supports. And if they're not sure what to do, my hope is that they'll look around and ask about what to do within their services. Because as you know, Matthew well knows, there's a lot of services that are available that he has to work really hard to make sure that providers know that they're there for. So that would be my starting place. I hope that there's you know really accessible places, but I do want to make it so that people in all sorts of settings can get the best possible care without always, in other words, the future isn't specialized clinics like myself. The future is being able to provide care consistently across America, which is not straightforward. And I'm not saying that it's gonna, I don't think it's maybe possible that we'll just be able to walk into anywhere and work perfectly. But I think that communication and finding at least a, a, a provider that's willing to try is, um, is a good combination for success. Thank you. Sounds like you have a lot of great examples of uh, support that have definitely helped your patients be able to access um, quality care, which is, I think, what everyone wants. Um, you know, Matthew. Yeah. Oh, uh, no, I, up the, go ahead. If I may, so, you know, we have another comment in the, in the chat from Everett James, and I think, John, your recent statement about, you know, wanting this quality care to be accessible everywhere brings up the question of at home, right? And um, Everett 
wrote, I'd love to hear about any care services or home modifications you receive at home and whether you believe those are adequate and if COVID has made either the providers or insurers put greater emphasis on providing care at home for people with disabilities. Josie, do you have any, I'm curious to hear whether you have any insights in that area. I hate to even say this, my dogs were protecting me from the postman and I did not hear your question. Sure, I can. Please repeat. Of course. Um, so we have a question about whether um, you receive any care services or home modifications um, and whether you believe that those are adequate and if co whether COVID has made either the providers or insurers that you have to interact with um, put greater emphasis on home care. Great, thank you for that. Um, so yes, um, in my home, I have got, I've gotten various modifications support through my waiver um, and I use UPMC as well. Um, historically, I had some ramps put in. Um, I had doorways widened. Um, and currently, um, my, my house now has a generator that for me, because of my ventilator, is unbelievably helpful. Um, and as for looking at what COVID and the pandemic has done. You know, I think that people with disabilities, uh, for many of us, are kind of experts at, you know, staying in place, um, in isolation. Uh, and that's not necessarily a good thing, but it's because so many things were inaccessible. Or for some of like myself, um, I couldn't go to school when chicken pox was going around, which isn't a thing for, for kids these days, um, shows my age. But, you know, I think that we knew the issues of isolation, of not being able to get to services, of doctor's offices, whatever, um, before all of this. And now we are starting to see a world that is um, having a revelation of what is needed um, if you are stuck at home. And so I do believe that over the next few years, we're going to see a drastic improvement in home health care. We're going to see uh, more and more telemedicine. Um, some of the, the programs that were provided during COVID, like telemedicine, telecare, are being extended because they were so successful. Um, and so, yes, I think that healthcare provision, rehab will start to be uh, more prevalent in home and they have been unbelievably helpful for me. I'll piggyback off of Josie. I completely agree, Josie. Um, a lot of the appointments that we could do virtually when able to were a godsend for our family. Um, so it was one of the things I actually wrote a few notes before coming on was I really hope that, you know, providers and insurance companies kind of take that into consideration that um, not only individuals with disabilities and their families, but I think there's a lot of people and especially like mental health struggles as well um, I just think that there's so much good that comes from these virtual appointments and things like that. So that is definitely one thing that I hope stays um, for the long term. <laughs> um, so that's one, one point I wanted to make out. Um, something for us personally that has helped um, in the health system, um, for those of you who are local, um, Children's Hospital here in Pittsburgh, they have something called um, Child Life, and they have been absolutely amazing anytime that we've had our son there. Um, if we are able to call ahead and, and speak to them, they kind of have everything planned, ready, everything when we get there. So when our son had to have surgery, I mean, from the time we entered the door until the time he left a week later after surgery, I mean, everything, they did an amazing job of supporting our family, supporting his needs, adapting things, um, making things accessible for him that usually would not be. 
Um, you know, even one of our nurses was like willing to learn a couple of the basic sign languages, you know, basic signs to communicate with him. Um, because at that time, this was quite a few years ago, he wasn't as fluent with his speech device. And I don't think he had any verbal speech at that time. So again, as Josie mentioned earlier, having those people who are willing to listen and learn and kind of grow with you, but um, child life has made a huge impact on our family down at Children's Hospital. So I want to give the shout out there because they've been absolutely amazing. <laughs> um, I also wanted to bring up um, communication boards would be really helpful. I mean, like I said, our son uses a speech device, but sometimes families aren't either able to afford, at, afford that or have access to that, um, even though they're ways to, for insurance to pay it or for even the school. Um, some families don't have that. And so I just think it would be great for, you know, especially in an ER to have social stories, communication boards for those families who don't have resources like that. So that there's still a means for the child themselves to point to something on a picture, you know, what is hurting you? Because our son really struggles with that, but I know so many people do. Um, you know, with limited verbal speech and limited communication and things like that. So when he's hurt or sick, it's kind of a guessing game. So to have those communication boards, picture cards, social stories, I mean, if somebody has to go for an x-ray and you're just like, okay, I'm wheeling you off, that's very scary. Um, even for an adult, if they don't fully understand what you're talking about. So to have just pull up, okay, well, this person's going to an x-ray, just have, you know, picture cards of, you know, I'm in my bed, I'm gonna go to this room, I'm gonna get a picture taken of my leg, you know, something to kind of help communicate with the individuals um, that are that are being seen by by the uh, doctor. Um, something else that I had jotted some notes down on um, are just kind of like sensory bags. I know for not only just autistic individuals, but there are so many people with it, with varying disabilities that really struggle with sensory sensitivities. And I just think it's something like really, really important. So a lot of the times, um, if they know ahead of time that you know that we're coming, they do like turn off one of the rows of lights in the room so it's not as bright in the room. Um, Ethan does wear uh, noise canceling headphones a lot of the times when we're in public. So, but to provide those again for families who don't have those resources, I think would be really great. You know, a weighted blanket, a weighted lap, ta uh, weighted lap pad, um, fidget toys, anything that we can help kind of self-regulate, soothe, calm, and make them as comfortable as possible. And then it makes those behaviors decrease, the communication better, you know, happy child, happy parent, you know, all of that just kind of makes life a little bit easier when you're already in a stressful situation, whether you're hurt or sick. So those are just some of the things that I wanted to mention as uh, a parent and a caregiver. Thank you. I think, yes, Matthew, I'm glad that you admitted yourself. I think Christina did a great job talking about the supports um, and the accommodations that she and her family uses. And I'd love to hear a little bit from you about accommodations that you uh, have at your office. Yeah, so Christina did a, a great job of saying all of the things, and I'm so happy to hear that these are the things that are important to the caregivers and the families. Um, so, you know, at UPMC, we've done uh, a, a job trying to figure out what are all of the things that we can provide, because, you know, it's a lot different from a school situation where you know the person is coming. Um, you know, in, in the outpatient world, we do a whole lot better of knowing who's coming. Um, but we don't have that luxury at the inpatient hospitals because we have EDs that are open 24-7, 365. Uh, so the work that we've done is developing the toolkits, a lot of like what Christina had mentioned. We have our, um, our deaf and hard of hearing toolkit for tools and resources for people that are deaf and hard of hearing. We have our effective communication toolkit that has low-tech, high-impact communication aids for people that are uh, nonverbal, for people that are deaf or hard of hearing, or for people that... Um, have low vision. We've also recently created a, a sensory toolkit uh, for people that have sensory disabilities, things like the lap pad, the sensory tools, um, reusable noise canceling headphones. So um, they are wipeable, cleanable, and be, they are able to be used from patient to patient. Um, and we've also, we're working with folks in, um, at McGee specifically, developing more storyboards. So we have storyboards for um, x-ray, CT, blood draw, um, I know I'm forgetting some of them, uh, MRI, but we're also working on birthing storyboards because not everybody that is uh, birthing may be uh, understanding the birthing process, may need to communicate through a storyboard or a picture board. Um, so figuring out how to communicate with 
I will say 95% of the people that are coming through our doors and having those tools and resources available, but there's still going to be that 5% that needs something that is not a, a standard tool or resource. Uh, so we've actually created our Luhu program, which is uh, Let UPMC Help You, which is for individuals that need complex accommodations. They can call and they can reach out to our office prior to their admission, prior to their uh, physician appointment, um, and let us know they need complex accommodations so that we can prearrange for things like a pressure relief mattress, an adaptive call bell, a, a patient room that is close to the nurse's station or further from the nurse's station so that it, it can be sensory friendly. Um, and also so that we can prearrange all of those accommodations like the child life specialists do at Children's, but for our adult hospitals as well. So it's really important that communication piece. Um, knowing that people are coming is helpful, but we don't know that everybody is always coming to the hospital. So it's important that we have 95% of the tools and resources ready to go. Um, and then it's that 5% of the population that we might have to, to make a phone call and say, here's the patient population that we're working with. Is there something else in addition to these tools and resources that we have on demand? You know, just to be okay. clear, I think it's really helpful for people to see that there are people like Matthew out there that do this work that exist across the system because you know, physicians are, are, are pretty narrowly skilled in terms of what they can do. And when it comes to, you know, helping organize lar larger sets of services, you know, we, we struggle. I mean, I would admit, you know, home health services, it's not something that I really am very good at. Uh, we, you know, women's health, we don't do a lot of it. And when people ask me to, I always feel like I don't have the, I'm just not, uh, I'm just not uh, really well skilled at it. Um, so I think, you know, whenever you're struggling, just remembering that you may want to stop at whatever level you're at, if that's like trying to find the right doctor and start to find, you know, whether it's a community resource or an institutional or corporate resource, um, like having a large healthcare system that might be a different angle at getting the services that you need. I think um, that is really important. And so much of this conversation has come back around to communication and how important that is. Um, and I'm gonna turn that a little bit. Um, I know there's a lot of talk in the chat right now about home and community-based services. And I will bring the conversation around to there in a moment. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about including uh, caregivers, whether it is a family unpaid caregiver or a paid caregiver who's maybe helping a disabled patient um, get to their appointment and how we can make sure that they are well integrated in the system while still making sure that the patient's needs uh, stay centered. So either, um, Christina, maybe if you want to start talking a little bit uh, about your experiences as a family caregiver and how, what do you think could be done to kind of better improve that communication uh, between the whole care team, including yourselves? And then I'll let anyone else jump in after you. Okay, um, as far as um, getting to appointment and things like that, um, I honestly, I quit my job years ago. I dropped out of nursing school to become full-time caregiver, mom, all the things. Um, I have since started working again, but that took many years. Um, so I honestly drove him to anything and everything. Um, so thankfully we had the means to do that uh, while my husband was working. Um, as far as you know, being part of the team. I think Josie had touched on that as well, you know, being an active part of the team. You know, until Ethan's able to speak more for himself and communicate and advocate for himself, I just think it's it's so important that we are all a team together and that our voices are heard, um, that our feelings are validated, that everyone kind of has their own important part um, in that team. Um, I think I did touch on a lot of the things earlier, um, mentioning things that, I, you know, that have worked for us, you know, at the hospital and things like that. Um, I love uh, what Matthew had brought up about um, the electronic files, because it was something that I had in my notes. I said, there has to be something like in the computer system where we can have like, almost like an all about me page about this individual. So like, likes, dislikes, uh, what works for me, what doesn't work for me? Um, how do I communicate? Things like that. 
Um, or maybe there's like a big fear of like the x-ray machine or something like how amazing would it be to know all of these things ahead of time. So when the patient is in your room in the ER and you click on that button and this like one pager comes up and you can read all these things before even going in the room. And then of course they can, you know, tell you more. But um, so that was something that I think would, would really be helpful. Um, I do just want to touch too on the restroom issue. I don't know, Heather, if there was another time to bring it up, is it okay that I just say it now or... Is that okay? Okay, so Sorry, I did I did it to unmute. Yes. Okay. Please, now now okay. is perfect. So that is something that has been a, an ongoing issue for our son since he was young. Um, you know, baby changing tables are for babies and small toddlers up to about 35 pounds. Um, so any any individual larger than that cannot use a baby changing table. So, you know, as Ethan got older and larger and we, you know, with even Miracle League, you know, baseball games and things that he was doing and we were out in the community, the bigger he's getting, it's getting harder to find an area that is private and safe and dignified for him. And, you know, laying a beach towel down on a bathroom floor and changing our son is undignified, inhumane. Nobody should ever have to lay their loved one on a public restroom floor. For women, we don't even want to put our purses on there, yet we're laying our loved ones on public restroom floor. So it really speaks volumes of how wrong this is so what happens is this the older he's getting you know we're not going places or you know we're planning way ahead and maybe only staying out an hour as opposed to three or four um, a lot of the times our family splits up you know my husband with our other children me with my my other son um, and it shouldn't be like that family should be able to enjoy time together in the community as a unit as a family and so many families aren't able to do that without inclusive accessible restrooms so this is why we do a lot of advocating with the Changing Spaces campaign. And a lot of the people on the call are very familiar with this, advocating for these height adjustable adult size changing tables, because whether you have a baby, a toddler, my son who's 10 and over hundred pounds already, or a grown man who's 200 pounds, you have somewhere safe and clean, you know, and dignified to clean them. And we do advocate for these in family restrooms. We make them and ask for them to be height adjustable. Um, so they are powered operated. And why this is so important for individuals who do use wheelchairs, if there's a caregiver helping them in this situation, the caregiver cannot lift the individual up onto the table, which is why fixed height tables or a bench are not a good idea. And so that's why we specifically advocate for these height adjustable um, adult size changing tables so that you are lower to able to lower it down to the height of the wheelchair. You can transfer the individual over, raise it up so the caregiver is also not injuring their back while they're changing them, clean them, get them back in their chair. And for our son, he isn't mobile and he's not a wheelchair user. So this is still helpful for me though, because I've already come up to some of them that are like at my waist, you know, or higher. And I'm trying to like, <laughs> like a big old sack of potatoes up onto the table and, you know, I'm hurting my back. You know, sometimes I'm straining my neck and so somebody's going to get hurt. So what happens is it's actually a bigger liability risks for companies and organizations and places that where big events happen. There's actually a larger liability risk by not having something that's accommodating and inclusive because either the individual is going to get hurt or the caregiver themselves and nobody wants that. So safety first, you know, private dignified space. And so this is why it's just so important. So if I had to ask for something too, especially in the healthcare system, because to my knowledge here in the surrounding greater Pittsburgh, uh, Children's Hospital has one, I don't know of any others in the hospital. So I just, out of all places that you would think that there would be these <laughs> height adjustable adult size changing tables, I think hospitals would be on like the top of your radar and they're just not. There are some in the, in the area that we've advocated for and we've been able to retrofit them in, you know, YMCA and Sewickley, um, we've had the Miracle League fields add them in, um, the museum lab that's part of um, the Children's Museum down in Pittsburgh, the aviary. Pittsburgh International Airport was the sixth in the entire nation to get one. So families should be able to travel, families should be able to be in the community, families should be able to go to doctor's appointments and have an, an accessible restroom as well. So I just wanted to put all that out there because unless it's you know an issue that you deal with personally or know someone who does, it's it's life changing for families just by this one piece of equipment. So just wanted to throw that out there too. But thank you for your time. Thank you. I think that's really important, and it helps us remember that sometimes 
the supports may not seem directly health care related, but they actually are really important in helping uh, people with disabilities and their caregivers access that same quality of care, um, even if it doesn't seem like it's directly relevant. Before we move to our next question, I would love, um, Josie, you've done a lot of work advocating for the Family Care Act. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how that um, can help improve uh, health care access and utilization. Surely. So I'll kind of take spearhead that in a couple directions. Um, so as I feel everyone probably on this call knows, uh, we have a rapidly aging population um, and more people with quote unquote childhood conditions are surviving childhood uh, and living long into adulthood. And so we are coming upon a time that we are going to need more and more paid caregivers, but we also need to provide and care for our caregivers more. Um, and so right now in the Build Back Better um, and the work infrastructure bills, there is paid family and medical leave. And you know, we're, we're hoping and advocating that it stays in there, but what that would do would allow for caregivers to um, take paid time off of their jobs to provide that critical care for loved ones, people like family. So they could be blood or you know, married in or whatever. Um, and that is going to be vital for our future. We know that numbers you know, don't lie, that people at home cost significantly less than putting them in a nursing home and they live better lives and can have a full range of opportunities. And so caregiving in the home is the, the right next step. Um, so we are still not caring for our caregivers enough. Um, our, my personal care attendants get about $11 an hour. And I know that them going to McDonald's, they'll get $15 an hour. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not an easy boss here. Um, and so they deserve every bit of $15, $20 they can get. They should be making above like livable wage. Most of the people work for me do it because they love me, but they have to have multiple other jobs or a spouse that's providing. And so you either have people taking these jobs that can't get a job anywhere else or who are only there because they really care about you. And so we need to do a better job at supporting the caregivers. Thank you. Um, I have another question, but because you brought that up, Josie, and because there are a lot of questions and discussions um, in the chat about home and community-based services, um, Josie, I think I'm going to make you the point person for this question. Can you talk a little, there are a lot of questions about how to access home and community-based services where you find paid caregivers. Um, and I know you started to answer some of those in the chat, but mm -hmm. I think it's important enough that I'd like to address it um, out loud here because home and community-based services are an incredibly important part of the healthcare system but because they happen at home and not in a physician's office or in a hospital, they can be overlooked. So maybe you can talk a little bit about um, your experiences accessing home and community-based care, where you find caregivers and things like that. And sure, Christina, like if you, Christina, if you um, have any home-based care that happens for your son, please feel free to jump in also. 
so I was just on a White House town hall for United Spinal, um, and they were talking just about this issue right here about the need and importance of home and community based services um, and how our system still tends to promote institutional care over home and community-based care, um, even though we know home and community-based services are better for everyone, for the government, for taxes, for the person with disability and loved ones. Um, and so there is very much a disenfranchised system that still exists out there. Um, and so often trying to obtain and maintain adequate care is a full-time job and so I understand the the moms the dads the individuals that that's all they can do is just trying to keep everything going and keep their head above water um, I would highly recommend that if you do not have a waiver or whoever you know your loved one or some of you care for doesn't have a waiver I would highly recommend talking to your health provider talking to a center for independent living about applying um, some of the COVID relief funding has gone into Medicaid in our states, and so there is, um, they're working on the wait list for waivers right now. That is step one to getting a lot of it. Is it the end all? No, um, but it helps. Number two, you're going to have to decide if you want to use um, an agency to find in-home care or if you're going to become an employer yourself. Um, and in those situations, there's a whole string of options that you'll have to choose. Um, but I have found personally, talking again with community members, people with disabilities who have been there, done that, they are the best people to talk to. And that's why I think Centers for Independent Living are great um, about these services, because they can tell you what worked for them, what didn't work, and why. Um, but finding those caregivers is unbelievably hard, especially right now. Um, and I encourage you, don't just take the first person that applies. Um, bad things can happen when you do that. And so, do the background check. And I know that that's hard for some people, but I encourage you, follow up. Make sure you're getting the right person for the not job, not just filling a time slot. Thank you, Josie. I really appreciate you share, sharing your personal experiences. I know that many people uh, on today's call will find that very helpful. I'm going to pause to let anyone else address that question uh, if they would like to, and if not, I can move on um, to the next question. Okay, I will move on. Um, I'm not sure that anyone uh, on today's call will have a great answer for this, um, but I'm going to broaden it a bit um, in addition. So we had a question from Sarah, who asked about any experiences related to people with disabilities aging from adulthood through older adulthood. Any advice on how to prepare or manage health changes that come with age? I don't know that we have any um, experts on older adults on today's call. So I'm going to broaden it a bit. And also, Sarah, I'll let you know that we can follow up um, via email with some resources that we find as well. But I would love to hear anyone talk about transitions in general, either from uh, adolescence to adulthood or adulthood to older adulthood. Um, if you're able to talk a little bit about navigating those transitions. Let me first say I'm 37, um, so I'm not quite there yet. Um, but, but I think that 
we are in the right space to be thinking about universal design regardless. Um, you know, as you're finding a home or an apartment, considering for this is for everyone, disability or not, that you might not be able to do steps someday. You might have trouble hearing someday and being set up for that. Um, but something interesting that I did was I went from pediatrics to gerontology. Um, I went straight to geriatric care because they are more comfortable with dealing with lots of specialists um, than many other family medicine doctors. And so although it seems strange, I would encourage people to look at geriatric medicine um, as kind of the general practitioner, just so that you're talking about all these issues. You have all the people in place for when you need those additional supports. Um, and a, as a part of my practice, um, because we offer access for a lot of people with physical disabilities, we are definitely the go-to geriatric gynecologists for you know, nursing homes and, and places like that. And I would first say that you know, for, for women um, with intellectual disabilities that um, menopause is a, a really interesting transition. Not, some people really uh, you know, roll through it well, but there is a whole literature around menopause and people with autism spectrum disorder and things like that, where there's definitely some changes that go on that, that it would be unfortunate to miss them and just be like, let's, you know, and for to be managed purely by uh, you know, behavioral health specialists rather than someone that can actually say, oh, we can manage hot flashes that this person may not be able to communicate and things like that. Um, and I'll, I'll say also from the, the perspective of seeing people that I know were living at home with their family members and were later transitioned to congregate care settings is that there really is a breakdown in communication. Um, I do think that congregate care settings like group homes and, and everything are desperately trying to do the best for all of their uh, clients and residents, but it's often very difficult for medical providers to understand what happened before they went into that setting the, the communication is just very difficult to understand before so you know i'm not sure what the solution is there but for um, for people that may foresee of themselves or loved ones going into um, a congregate care setting at some point being able to provide some communication with uh with healthcare providers about like long-term health the kind of the health narratives of their lives it would be really helpful because unfortunately there's a lot of people that I just don't know their long-term background because they're in a setting where that's just not available to the, the caregivers uh, in congregate care settings. Thank you. Um, we have a question in the chat that I think, Christina, is related to what you talked about at the very beginning of our call today. Um, and the question is, uh, I'm seeing a lot of issues with diagnostic overshadowing. Families with children of all ages into adulthood who demonstrate behaviors of concern are being discharged by professionals without their needs being addressed. Systems seem to be leaning more on natural supports to provide services, many of whom are exhausted while not honoring the voice of the family. Christina, I think you talked about um, not feeling that your voice was always honored and needing to kind of advocate towards that. So maybe you could share a bit about your experiences with that. Absolutely, I'd be happy to. Um, this hits home for me, and I apologize now if there are some tears, but this was this was tough um, because when Ethan was little, just so you know, Ethan is a twin. So we have an 18-year-old daughter, so we were down this road before as parents, right? But with Ethan and Brayden, our twins, you not only did we have our daughter, and we remember how we raised her, and you know, special, you know, different different things, different milestones that she hit, right? But when you have it side by side, right in front of you, it was clear as day. So we knew from the moment that Ethan was born that something—I don't want to say that something was wrong, because I don't like—I don't like to say that nothing's wrong. Just something was different. 
We have known that since the day he was born. By the time he was six months, our concerns just kept growing. And I started documenting things. I would video a couple things or, you know, things that he did that like his brother didn't do or things that he didn't do that his brother was doing. And now all children develop at different times and do different things that, you know, at different ages. And we understand that. Um, they're all their independent selves, but there were so many things that he was globally and developmentally behind in that raised all these red flags for us. So every time we went to the pediatrician, same pediatrician until he was about 14 months, they were 14 months. I would have my long list of questions and all these concerns with Ethan and then, you know, a couple questions for Brayden. And the thing that always was alarming to me that even though I had, I came prepared and I had my concerns written down, the questions that they ask you as the parent, you know, is your child doing this? Is your child rolling over? Is your child babbling? Blah, 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 blah. All of them were no for Ethan and all of them were yes for Brayden. Even still, my, our concerns were not validated. They dismissed them. Exact words from our pediatrician at the time were, he's a chubby, lazy baby. And I will never, ever, ever forget, because she said it multiple times and even wrote it in his chart, because when I switched doctors in the practice, he actually saw it in the chart. And I, because I told him what she said, and I started crying. And I just said, we've had concerns since he was a little baby, and I've never felt heard. I've never felt listened to. It was like I was this overdramatic mom, like he's a boy, he's going to catch up, he's going to do all those things. And I just think there is such a huge problem with that when practitioners and doctors and other medical professionals are not listening to these concerns that parents have. And it's not that we were necessarily searching for a diagnosis. We were searching for answers to the questions that we had and ultimately finding him the help that he needed to learn and to grow as a child. And, you know, and we just, we weren't getting that from our pediatrician. And, you know, at the 12 month, at the 12 month mark, he wasn't babbling. He wasn't crawling. He wasn't walking. He wasn't talking nothing, but his twin brother was doing all of those things. And even then she still had the audacity to look at me and say, I still just think he's a lazy baby. And I looked at her and I said, well, but what does that mean? I feel like if he's not crawling, if he's not walking, if he's not babbling and all these, like there must be a reason why. I don't think babies are lazy. Like there must be a why, whether it's physical or cognitive or something's going on that's preventing him from being able to do these things. And so for anyone asking, all I can say is the first thing I did was switch doctors. I could not take not being heard anymore. I just switched doctors to a different doctor in the practice, actually made them put a note in the chart that she was never permitted to see my son again, <laughs> um, any of my children. And then as soon as we started with the doctor, within a half hour appointment of seeing this other man, he had us going and getting an, an MRI. He had you know, services within our home getting PTOT speech. I had no idea that any of these things ex existed, none. I was like, what do, you, what do you mean people are gonna come in my home? What do you mean he's delayed and all these things? What do you mean? And I just started crying out of frustration because I thought, I, I've been saying this for a year and nobody, she was not listening. She was not listening. So the first thing we did was switch doctors. The next thing we did was do all the, th all the steps that he said, you know, and unfortunately we did run into another doctor like during testing and things that he's too happy to have autism. Um, so again, there's other, <laughs> there are other doctors that still didn't listen along the way but you switch, you go to a different doctor. I always say, follow your instinct, follow that, that gut feeling that you have, you know your child best, right? And always bring your questions, concerns, document them. Like I started taking, I said, I, I took notes, but I also took some videos and things of things that he would do or not do um, that were, you know, not typical, right? Um, because I didn't, I didn't know what they were. And I, again, it wasn't searching for the diagnosis. It was searching for answers to what was going on with our son. And ultimately, I mean, it took three doctors later. Um, we found a doctor who was absolutely amazing. You know, we switched PCPs, but when we found a doctor who listened to us, she met with us first, then met with Ethan on three different occasions and just really sat down, took notes, 
actually recorded like our conversations so that she could go back and, and hear them over again. And just listening to someone, having someone who listens to you and, and validates your concerns and what you're saying and realizing that you do know your child best and somebody who sees your son for 10 minutes is not the answer. And so if I can say anything at all, I would say if you are not being heard and your concerns are not being validated, switch doctors. There are many good ones out there. We have fallen into quite a few bad ones, but there are so many good ones and just, just keep going. And, you know, you can reach out to me personally, if you, if you're in the area and I can say, you know, who our doctors are, I have no problem sharing that information. Um, but all I can say is just follow your gut, take notes, write down your concerns. If it helps to video certain things, you know, I think that's good for doctors to see because those behaviors of those things that are happening might not happen in the 20 minutes at your appointment. So, Always just follow your instinct and trust your gut and speak up. Your voice matters, especially until they can do it for themselves. Keep changing. There are good ones out there. <laughs> All right. Can I flip that on its head also? Um, I echo what you say. And um, from the self-advocate point of view, I had trouble transitioning into adult medicine where, or even adolescence still impedes. Um, where they would listen to my parents and not me. Um, and so there are both sides of that. There are, and I mean, certainly not downplaying what you said, because I know my family dealt with that as well. But there are times that still I'm 37 and I have a doctorate and they're like, they'll look at whoever brought me in that day and be like, well, what do you see, Mary Beth? What do you see, so-and-so? And, you know, I, I, it's good to get a team approach, but I think it's always important to believe your patient and their families um, and recognize who is the expert in the room and that's you and your family uh, as a self-advocate as a parent whatever that is um, and once again as Christina as you said find that doctor that listens to you Thank you so much, Christina and Josie. I know, I know that I and everyone on the call today really appreciate you sharing your experiences and your powerful words of advocacy. We are almost out of time, but before we go, um, Matthew, I'd love to give you a chance to um, share. I know there are people in Pennsylvania and Allegheny uh, County and Pittsburgh on this call. And I'd love for you to kind of walk people through the process of if they have a disability or, or, or are a caregiver of someone with a disability and they think they need an accommodation. Um, what can they do? How can they work with your office to make sure they have the accommodations that they need? Yeah, thanks, Heather. So I think the, the most important thing, and I'm going to take it all the way back, is that communication piece. So um, for any UPMC patient, we ask at the point of registration if you need any disability-related accommodations or sign language interpretation, and that's the perfect opportunity to say yes. Um, if you tell the folks that you need those accommodations when you're scheduling your appointments, um, they can get in touch with the office. So our central scheduling department is working in the electronic health record is documenting if you need an appointment, uh, if you need an accommodation during your appointment. Uh, so that's very important. And you know, it's exciting to know that um, this information is being collected and this information is being shared from appointment to appointment and from physician to ph physician. Uh, if you are in need of accommodations, it's always great to call your provider's office, let them know that you need accommodations. Um, but again, as I mentioned, we do have our LUHU program, which is Let UPMC Help You. Um, and you can request accommodations through the LUHU process. It's all handled through the Disabilities Resource Center. We will uh, reach out to the provider, make sure that the accommodations are known, make sure those accommodations are provided. Um, and you can find more information about our LUHU program at upmc.com slash L-U-H-U. Um, you know, and again, it's all about that communication, all about making sure that uh, you're sharing the information, you're sharing what accommodations are needed. Um, because if we don't know, we can't provide them, quite honestly. So. It's very important that you are speaking up about your accommodations and speaking up about your disability. Um, and disability disclosure is important in the healthcare setting. Matthew, we have a quick follow-up question um, about Western sites 
And if that, um, someone who says that process did not happen at Western site, how slash why are they different? Are they, or was that just kind of a failure in the system? So our LUHU program covers all 40 hospitals in the UPMC system. So uh, Western Psych is part of our hospital system. Um, so if you reach out to us about our LUHU program, even, it's, even if it's at Western Psych, uh, that's definitely something that we can reach out to what we call our disability champions that we have at each one of our hospitals, as well as our physician offices. We have disability champions at each one of our um, business units. So we can reach out to our disability champions and make sure that those accommodations are met through our boots on the ground. I mean, we're a small office working for 40 hospitals, 900 outpatient clinics, um, senior communities, and, and anything else that has UPMC's name on it. Um, so it's it's important that we're, we're utilizing our boots on the ground as well with our disability champions. So, um, and if there is anybody out there that said, you know, hey, I had this experience at one of the UPMC locations, um, and they wanna share that information with us so that we can make it better for the second time around, they can also reach out to us and they can visit our website uh, which is upmc.com slash DRC. Uh, and they can reach out to us that way as well to, to share feedback because we also want to hear that as well. Thank you so much. Um, I know that we are just about out of time. Um, and I know that we were not able to get to everyone in the chat. I really apologize. Um, I'm going to ask anyone if they have any final words to share any final advice or wishes um, to share before I close things up. Okay, so oh, oh, we, Josie, yeah, I, no, I'm yeah, sorry. I get excited. Sorry. Um, so I guess just quickly for those of you who are advocates, self or family or loved ones. If you hear the word no, or you're, it's fine, don't worry about it, keep digging. There are other answers. Keep looking. Um, <laughs> there's my baby dog. Um, but then, you know, also for those of you who are professionals, maybe you're in school to be a nurse, um, I, I ask you to be the one asking. I ask you to ask how people want to be referred like their disability, how they want to be supported. Don't assume, ask the person, not the person that walked in with them. Um, and I, just being okay with not knowing everything is good. That's fine. Questions are good. That's it. I mean, you know, I know that there's many challenges in the system, but I do want to just say that for for a provider like myself, and I think many others, that it is a, a, the highest privilege to be able to see, to take care of people you know, of all different uh, needs. And uh, it really makes my week um, to care for all, I mean, people in all over the place, whether it's someone with autism spectrum or who has a unique disease that I've never heard of that I get to learn about during that day or see what people do and obviously see what caregivers uh, do, you know, do for their loved ones that, um, that I hope, I just want to say from a caregiver perspective that it's a great honor to meet you all and to care for you. And, um, and I, I know that there's many problems with it, but we really do. Um, it's really just a, it's an amazing thing to get to see what, um, what human beings do in the world and how we care for each other. And, um, and it's not what me, what doctors do for five minutes a day but what people do and live their lives and just get to see how people are made is an amazing thing. So I don't want to, I don't want to sell people short and say that's a, a tough, a tough thing um, because there's, there's a lot of joy that happens when we interact, I think, um, and care for each other. Thank you so much. Um, I know I really appreciated hearing from all of you, and I know everyone who is typing curiously in the chat, really, really appreciated um, and have specifically said that they have felt less alone after hearing from all of your perspectives today. So we can't thank you enough for sharing your time and your stories with us here today. I just want to encourage um, anyone who 
still has questions to reach out to us. Um, our website is www.hairibbing.pit.edu and you can send us an email at hairibbing at pit.edu. And we really appreciate all of you um, being here with us today. Before we leave, um, I'm going to let Heidi uh, bring us to a close as our center director. Thank you, Heather. Um, boy, it's hard to, uh, to, to add anything meaningful to what uh, you all have shared. I'm sort of really trying to process all of this. Um, I wanna thank each and every one of you, Christina, Josie, John, um, and Matthew for being here and um, sharing your personal and professional insights with us. It's really been meaningful. And thank you, Heather, for putting together this amazing panel. Um, I just want to say that, you know, as the one of the co-directors of this center, you know, we come to this as researchers primarily and um, what sets research apart is its slow systematic process. And I think what's the beauty of Nidler funding is that we're challenged to um, try to move evidence into to practice and clinical care and into homes more quickly. And I think it's, um, programs like this that really continue to motivate us to do that. Um, I did put in a response to, I think, Angela and Michelle and Kelly and the others um, that, you know, we feel pretty inadequate sometimes in, you know, what we can do to help make things right and change the system. And, um, you know, I think we at the center are committed to doing that and we're committed to listening and hearing where we need to do more and do better. So thank you all for, you know, your input and for being here. And we hope to continue to collaborate and hear from you all um, in the future. So um, I guess as a plug, please be on our um, mailing list. We'll reach out to you for other things. We'll reach out to you for advice. Um, we're going to have a caregiving workshop coming up um, in March that's associated with our research conference, and we'll be letting you know about that, and we'd love to invite you um, to participate in that, whether you're local or remote, and so keep your eyes open for um, emails from us around that. Um, I also want you to know that um, for those of you who've participated, whether on the panel and um, in our chats that um, this, this has been recorded um, and will be integrated into um, a, a required course in the School of Nursing at the University of Pittsburgh um, on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we hope that you know, your ideas and your passion um, gets passed on to these very important um, they're graduate student nurses who, you know, we view as future leaders in healthcare. So um, hopefully this, this uh, town hall lives beyond you. So thank you very much for being here. And thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists. We so appreciate it.